My name is VNA Cornejo. I am a domestic violence survivor, and this is my story. Throughout the hard times, we're still making changes. Find the ways to help each other. Many similar faces. There's a way. I was raised in Pomona, California. Um, for the first nine years of my life, uh, I think it was pretty calm. We had a pretty calm household. Um, my dad was always working. He was the breadwinner, so, you know, I remember him always working, working, working. He was a mechanic, so um, there was always parts and the smell of oil everywhere in the house, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Um, for the first two years, it was just me, um, and then came my brother, um, and my parents had a very good relationship. I don't remember them arguing, but my dad uh, became very successful very quickly, um, by the time I think I was like eight years old, he already had his own mechanic shop. And sh in his shop, he had about 16 employees. Um, he, he was making money left and right, and we were living pretty good. So I think that's when the problem started between my parents. Um, I remember them arguing constantly back and forth. Uh, my dad was never violent towards my mom, but there was just these heated arguments between them. And um, then the talks about my dad cheating on my mom started coming out. And I didn't understand at the moment what was going on, but I would just hear it. And I'm, I'm sure my brother also heard it. And so my dad's, you know, making all this money. And from what I remember was he was also doing other things that, he shouldn't have, you know, I started seeing more money at his shop and, you know, I started seeing drugs and I didn't understand why. So by the time I was nine years old, my parents divorced. And at that moment, I don't remember it being hard on me. I didn't understand, but eventually it did. But I never really knew the real reason for their divorce. But at that time, it was me, my brother, and my mom had just had my little sister. She was nine months at the moment when my parents divorced. And we were all on our own. My dad pretty much, you know, sold the house that we were in. We lived in Ganesha Hills. We had this beautiful home, two, bed, um, two stories, um, four bedrooms, huge backyard. I mean, it was like the most beautiful house ever. To me, it was like a castle. And they sold the house. And we were just on our own. It was my mom and my siblings. And my dad decided to rent out this business for my mom so that she could provide for us while he wasn't in the picture. Well, obviously, he wasn't going to be in the picture anymore. So um, he tried to just, like, set her up, you know, with this business. And um, we didn't have a home. So this business, th it was a party supply store in Pomona. This business became our home. We ended up moving in there um, with me, my brother, and my sister, and my mom. And I remember that place being extremely cold. My mom slept in one room, and me and my siblings slept in another. And I remember that room being extremely cold. We didn't have a shower. We had to shower inside a bucket, a huge top bucket, and we would have to pour water on our head with this little plate. And we did that for a while until my mom was able to get on her feet. But in the meantime, my dad had already established a relationship with somebody else. And everything was happening so quickly, and I didn't, I, you know, I was lost. I didn't understand why everything had moved so quickly. My mom already had started another relationship with a man, and she became pregnant. And then I found out my dad had already had... Um, a baby on the way as well so it was just so much information coming into me and I didn't understand what was going on um, times were really tough in my mom's business um, I remember she used to cook food for us on this grill on this portable grill and we would struggle you know I remember her trying to make whatever she could you know eggs with weenies and bacon and it was just hard, but she never showed it. She was just this tough woman, and she never showed a sign of weakness, and she was always working and working, and my dad wasn't in the picture. Like, he came and picked us up every other weekend, but that was it. Like, to him, it was like, okay, I'm going to pick you up a Saturday and Sunday, 
and I'm going to take you to my shop. We're going to hang out a little bit, and I'm going to take you back. So that was rough. Like, I didn't understand why my dad didn't want to be with us. With time, I understood that it was because he was with his new family. Um, so eventually, with time, we ended up moving out from my mom's business, and we moved to Ontario. We lived in Ontario for about two years, um, but while we were living there, my mom was always working. And her boyfriend was living with us, but he was also working. So it was me, my brother, my sister, and we had all this freedom. Like, there was, I can't really say that we had discipline in our home because we didn't. We were always on our own. I remember getting out of high sc uh, middle school and walking home. I used to walk home with all my friends and just go to the liquor store and buy hot Cheetos and... You know, we would stop the ice cream man and just buy whatever we wanted. And then I would walk home with one of my best friends and we would just hang out to like 5, 6 p.m. at night. And my mom at work, you know, my dad wasn't around. So I never got that discipline from my mom. And it's not because she didn't want to. It was just she was busy in life trying to raise us and trying to provide for us. Um. In Ontario, we, leave for, we lived for two years, and then life there wasn't, I can't really say that life was bad, but again, me and my siblings just didn't receive that attention from my dad or my mom, and eventually, we ended up moving to Pomona. We ended up moving back to Pomona, and I think that's when things started shifting for me. Um, my mom wasn't really... She wasn't the type of woman that would sit down with me and explain to me what puberty was. She didn't tell me that I was going to go through these physical changes. She didn't tell me that my body was going to start developing, that I was going to start liking boys, and neither did my dad. So at this time, my body started developing, and I started feeling all these things, and I started, you know, questioning a lot of things in my life, and nobody gave me answers. And I didn't really ask anybody because I didn't, trust anybody. I didn't trust my mom because she wasn't around. I didn't trust my dad because he was always busy with his life and his other kids and, you know, his shop and his mind was set on money, making money, making money. So my dad ended up moving to a house in Rialto and he would pick us up on the weekends and sometimes Tuesdays and Thursdays. But for the most part, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we would just be at the shop with him. On the weekend, we would go over to his house and when we were over there with him, there was no time for us. He was always with his girlfriend. Um, he was with his other kids. Me and my siblings would literally go anywhere we wanted. We did whatever we wanted. We weren't doing nothing bad. You know, we weren't doing drugs. We weren't drinking alcohol. But we just had a lot of freedom. We did whatever we wanted. And, again, there was no discipline. We didn't have him to tell us, like, hey, you can't be going out. There was none of that. So, you know, I'm developing. I have, you know, I started, you know, doing my makeup and I started doing things with my hair. And there was this man that lived with my dad. This man would try to do things to get my attention. And I never really understood why at the beginning, you know. I didn't understand what love was. I didn't know boyfriends. I didn't know any of that because it wasn't taught to me. So he would try to do things to get my attention. He would try to, like, come out of his room at the same time that I came out of my room. Um, I would get out at night from my room and go to the kitchen and, you know, try to grab something to eat, and he was always right there. This man was six years older than me. Um, and my dad had this thing where it was already, like, 9 p.m., and he would be like, I'm going to go to my room. I'm going to go to sleep. He would take some pills and just knock out. So he never came out of the room. He never paid any attention to what was going on with me or my siblings. So with time, his persistent with me, like he was very persistent with me. He kept trying and trying and trying. And eventually I fell for what he was doing towards me. And I ended up developing feelings for this older man. And I didn't understand. I was like, I'm only a little girl. Like, why do I like this older man? Or why am I feeling this? So... Eventually, with time, uh, I ended up getting his phone number. I was talking to him. I was texting t with him. And to me, it was like, this is my boyfriend. Like, I have a boyfriend now. I'm 13, and I have a boyfriend. 
And he just knew all the right things to say, you know, like he was an older man. He already knew exactly how to talk to somebody my age. And like I said, my dad never paid attention to anything I did. So it was easy for me to talk, to flirt, to talk to him, to message this man. And eventually, um, I lost my virginity to this man. Um, the first time, it was very, you know, I, I didn't understand what had happened. I didn't know what sex was. I didn't know anything. I was lost. I, you know, I just thought it was something normal. Okay, this is my boyfriend. This is supposed to happen. So at the time when we were living in Pomona, like I said, my mom wasn't around, so I always found ways to talk to this man, to text him, to go out and spend time with him. I would say I was going to go to the movies with my cousins, and in reality, I was going to go with him. Um, and in order for me not to show my brother and my sister that I was talking to him, I would always tell them, like, hey, you guys go outside. Go play with the neighbors. And my mom was at home, so it was easy for me to be like, hey, you know, you guys just go outside. And I would be on the phone with him and talking to him. And then my siblings eventually would come inside. And it was like nothing ever happened. And they never saw it. But with time, my, my relationship with him grew. And by this time, my dad had already bought a home in Rialto. And it was this big house, two-story house. And me and my siblings slept downstairs. And... He, this man, he slept upstairs. And like I said, we were always texting, so there was always a way for him to get a hold of me, like, hey, you know, come over here or do this or do that. And I would just do it. And this one night, he told me, like, hey, uh, come upstairs. So I left my room, and I walked upstairs. And in my mind, I thought, oh, I'm just going to go upstairs to say goodnight, to just be like, oh, you know, I'll see you tomorrow. It, I didn't think much of it. So I went upstairs, and he tells me, oh, come inside the room. And I told him, I don't want to. I just, something was off. Something told me in my heart, like, you're going to put yourself in a bad situation. And he kept pressuring me, like, come inside. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll go inside the room. So I walk inside the room, and on the floor, there's already some blankets and a pillow. And I was like, well, what do you want? And the first thing he said is like, oh, we're going to have sex. And I told him, I don't want to. Like, leave me alone. First of all, my dad's in the other room, and I just don't want to. I smelled alcohol on him, and I knew he had been doing drugs because they had told me that he was doing crystal. And I knew about it, but I didn't understand what drugs were. I didn't understand what crystal was. I didn't understand what weed was or how people got high. I didn't understand because I didn't grow up around it or nobody shared that knowledge with me. So... When I told him no, he got really upset, and he grabbed me from my arms, and he just threw me on that area where the, where the blankets were and the pillow, and he hit me in the head, he pulled my hair, and he forced me to have sex with him. So, you know, he raped me. And that night, I started crying, I went downstairs, and... I woke up the next morning like if nothing had happened. I didn't understand why he had done this to me. I didn't understand what the word rape was. I didn't understand why he used force. I just didn't understand. You know, I thought this man loved me. I thought, you know, this man is giving me what my dad's not giving me. So, you know, this should be right. This, this is the right thing. But... I realized that that moment I felt pain. I was scared. I felt lonely. I felt like I couldn't talk to nobody. But I wasn't able to express how I felt, so I just kept it inside, and I didn't say nothing, and I didn't tell nobody for a very long time. So we were still going with my dad on the weekends. We were still spending time with him, and... Nobody ever questioned, oh, VNA looks different. Oh, you know, she, she's acting different. She's walking, nothing. Nobody ever questioned anything. And like I said, I don't think it was because my parents were intentionally trying to not pay attention to me. It was just they had their hands full. And, you know, for the most part, my mom was always working. You know, my dad, you know, I think the story with him is a little different because he he could have done, he, he had the power to do more, and he just chose not to. But, 
you know, I guess it was just in the circumstances he was in, and, you know, that's all he could do for us, for me. So this one weekend, we went over to my dad's house, and I decided to write this letter to one of my cousins. And in this letter, I told her, like, hey, cousin, like, there's something that I need to tell you. It's about this man. And she knew who he was. And I don't know why I got this letter. I folded it up and put it in my backpack where I would always put my clothes to go with my dad. And, you know, we spent the weekend with my dad, and then we went back with my mom. And my mom never went through my stuff. She always, you know, I could say respected my privacy, and she never went through my room or nothing. But that weekend, she decided to go through my backpack, and she found that letter. And I was in the kitchen, and I remember her calling me like, hey, come over here. And I went to her, and I was like, what, you know? And she tells me, like, what is this letter? What does this mean? What do you need to tell your cousin so bad about this man? And she was just on me, questioning me, questioning me. And I just, I didn't trust my mom, but I think something in me knew that I had to tell my mom. I think it was like my, I felt like it was my only chance to share with my mom that I went through this and I didn't understand why it happened, but I needed to tell her. So when I told my mom, I remember her face getting red and she started shaking and she was just, she was just devastated and she was heartbroken and she kept telling me like, why did you do this? Like, por qué, por qué, por qué no me dijiste? Why didn't you tell me? And I wasn't crying. I was just looking at her, you know, in her eyes, and I didn't say nothing. Like, I, in my eyes, I didn't understand that what I did was wrong. I knew what they had done to me was wrong, but I didn't understand why I was being attacked, why my mom was yelling at me. So, you know, I let her have her moment. I went to the kitchen, and then I see her getting on the phone, calling my dad, and she tells my dad, like, v just told me this. We need to go to the police station. So um, she told him that, and my dad came down, and we went to the police station, and we made the report. Um, when you go to the police station and you explain to them that you have been raped, you know, they take every all the notes down. They ask you specific details about what happened and, you know, how they did and what they did to you, where did they touch you. It's just, it's honestly really traumatic. And at the moment when I was saying it, I didn't realize what had happened to me. But when I finished saying, I was like, oh, man, what happened to me is really bad. So that was kind of like an eye opener for me. And I realized, OK, if I'm here at the police station, what they did to me is bad. So we ended up uh, we, we stopped the interview. I mean, we ended up doing the questioning back and forth. And the police officer says, well, because you have been raped we need to take you to the local hospital because they need to do a physical exam. So we're done, and we're almost leaving. And I think what happened next is what defined who I became after and why I did the things that I did. My dad got on the phone, and he called this man, the man who had harmed me, the man who had raped me, the man who had you know, brainwashed me to believe that what I had with him was love. He calls him and he tells him like, hey, we just came to the police station. You need to get the fuck out of Rialto and you need to book it to Mexico. At that moment, I didn't understand. I was like, why would he be calling him? Why does he need to tell him what just happened to me? Why does he need to save him if I'm the one that needs to be saved? Not this man who hurt me, who who caused me all this harm. And my mom was there, and, and I don't remember her saying anything back. And I don't, rem I don't know if, if I don't remember because I just blocked that whole moment out. But I know that after that, I was never the same. I know that I questioned a lot about who I was, and I, I questioned my body. I questioned what I wanted to be in life because I felt like if my dad didn't have my back, who was going to have my back in the future? My mom couldn't have my back because she was working. She had to take care of us by herself. Like, who was I going to turn to for help? So 
after this, this man ended up leaving to Mexico. And we were still, you know, me and my siblings were still going to my, my dad's house. And it was like if nothing had happened. I remember feeling like, okay, this just happened to me. I lost my virginity. And nobody's talking to me. To me. Nobody's asking me how I feel. Nobody's trying to see if I'm hurt, if I'm physically hurt. Yeah, they took me to the hospital and they did a physical exam, but that's not caring about me. And my mom never sat down with me and had a talk after and, you know, explained anything. She just just didn't. And I wasn't mad. I just didn't understand it. And I didn't feel like I could ask any questions because I just didn't trust anybody. I think uh, with time, my mom started noticing the little things that I was doing. So I remember her trying more to make my birthday speci special. I remember her trying to fill the tree with presents. I remember her trying to be a little bit more involved with me. And the whole time that my mom was trying, my dad was still just there. Like, it, I don't even know how to explain it. Like, he, he was my father, and we would spend time with him, but it's like he wasn't really there. We never had quality time with him. I didn't have quality time with him. So, you know, I turned 15, and my mom threw me this beautiful quinceañera. Like, it, it was... She busted her ass to make sure that this day was magical for me. I got to pick the dress that I wanted. Um, I had a DJ. I had this nice salon. My friends were there. And I remember her telling me, like, you know, pick whatever dress you want. Uh, let's go do your nails. And I kept thinking to myself, like, no, I don't want to do this to my mom. I don't want to make her spend all this money. And it's funny because she's the one that decided we're going to throw you a quinceañera. So I think that was her way of showing me that she loved me. That was her way of trying to communicate with me, like, I'm sorry for what happened to you. But she never really said those words. So I had my quinceañera, um, and my dad showed up, you know, and he showed up, like, with his head up high. Like, I remember him trying to make himself, like, if he was the one that organized this party when in reality it wasn't. And like I said, at the moment, I didn't question, I didn't say nothing, but... You know, when I remember, I'm like, you didn't plan on it. It was all my mom. Um, during my quinceañera, I actually got to have a special dance with my great-grandmother who passed away a few years ago, and it was the most beautiful moment in my life. And after that, after my quinceañera, like I said, my mom, you know, she had this party for me, and she always kept trying to do things for me, and it was always with gifts or letting me do whatever I want, or letting me go out with my friends, letting me just do whatever it is that I wanted to do. But there was no discipline. I never had consequences for, for anything. And even if she did try to punish me, I would always find a way to get out of it. So I remember after my quinceañera, I started to have boyfriends that were older than me, five years older than me, six years older than me, um, and nobody ever told me that it was wrong. Even with what had happened to me, nobody ever told me, like, you can't be dating somebody that's this older than you because it's wrong. And even with what happened with me, I still didn't understand because nobody ever explained it to me. So I thought it was okay, you know. I was, you know, I was dating these men that were older than me. I was going out. I was going to parties. Um, I did start working on the weekends, but it was like Friday came and I was at school. And then I just went out with my friends. Or I would be home and my friends would come over and, you know, we would just hang around outside. Um, I wasn't one to start doing drugs or to start drinking. But to me, my escape was just being around other people and being around other older men and getting their attention. And, you know, I started developing and I started, like, seeing, like, okay, I'm going to do my makeup this way. I'm going to do my hair this way. Maybe boys are going to look at me this way. Um, and all throughout high school, you know, I kept dating older men and I kept my good grades, but sophomore year came around and I started ditching. Um, I would ditch two, three periods daily. Like I, I don't even know how I did it, but I was just not going to class and I still managed to get good grades. So I kind of like going to school, 
but you know the bad influence like my friends would tell me hey let's go you know and my friend had an apartment her boyfriend had an apartment so we would just go to their house and I was never in school but like I said I managed to get good grades and then junior year came and one of my closest friends her brother was this older man four years older and he would always pick her up from school so I remember one day walking I went to Gary High School and we walked to the Burger King across the street and it's me and her and I'm like well what are we waiting for you know my mom's gonna pick me up anytime soon she's like oh my brother's gonna pick me up and that day was the day I met my abuser he pulled up and you know I saw him and he had this hat on he had his earrings on you know big pro club to me it was like oh man this is an older man you know like I like that like you know right away I was attracted to him and the next day I called my you know we went to school we got home and the next day I called my friend and we're on the phone and she tells me like hey um my brother wants to talk to you and I was like your brother why would your brother want to talk to me and he she said oh because he just wants to get to know you you know I think she was kind of like the person that kind of influenced everything but you know I ended up talking to him on the phone and I immediately fell for this man he knew exactly what to say he knew how to say it he knew how to treat me um, I would get to school and I already had letters I had candy I would have gifts from him and the whole time I didn't realize it and you know what time I did he was brainwashing me so he's giving me all these letters he's saying the right things and these letters he would tell me like well I love you for who you are I love you know that you're this you're that and I he would always throw like your mom this your dad this like he knew what to say so I knew that he was defending me that he was having my back and I fell in love with him well what I thought was love again I didn't know what love was I didn't understand it but I was like okay this is somebody I can see myself with my mom ended up finding out that this was a man that I was seeing because of one of my ex-boyfriends and she never liked him and I think it was her instinct telling her like Miha this man is going to be bad for you she always was against him always all the time she would tell me like why are you talking to him why are you going to go see him and why this but again she would tell me not to do things but there was no real consequences there was no real punishment for what I was doing so I did whatever I wanted and I think we dated or we went out for a couple months and then I found out I was pregnant I didn't feel good and there was something going on I didn't understand what was going on with my body and why I felt this way so I had one of my close friends go with me after school to a local clinic and and you know back then you can go to a clinic at any age and get a pregnancy test and nobody qu would question it nobody you didn't need a parent signature so it was easy for us to do all this stuff so I found out I was pregnant and the doctor tells me like is the dad going to be there you know these are the re these are the stuff that you need in order to have a healthy pregnancy you need these pills you know you need to get insurance and I'm 17 years old and I'm getting all this information left or right and I didn't know I didn't understand it I don't know what was going on I was just like okay I have this baby in my stomach okay what you know what's next that day I went back to school and I was right there by the I, I walked towards my brother and he was right there by the tree and I remember going up to him and I was extremely nervous and I was like oh my god like what am I gonna do who am I gonna tell first am I gonna tell my brother like what is he gonna do he's gonna be upset and then I ended up just telling him like brother like I'm pregnant and I remember his face like he was just I felt like he was just so disappointed in me and it wasn't a bad thing like I knew he loved me I knew my brother loved me and I knew that he was just angry he was just like sister like why like especially with this man like why would you get pregnant and I remember him like we always we always had her back 
I always protected him, and he always had my back. That was, like, our relationship. Like, we were just so close. And I remember him telling me, like, if you don't tell my mom, I'm going to tell her. And I was like, whoa. Like, he was trying to be my big brother. And I went back home. I didn't tell my mom. I waited and I waited. And during this whole time, you know, this person that caused me harm, he was still in my head. He was still in my head. And, you know, he actually mentioned one time, like, you know, my mom told me that you should abort. You know, my mom thinks that you shouldn't have this baby. And I don't know why. Again, I didn't understand. I didn't know what abortion was either. I didn't know anything. I was just, you could say I was just naive. I didn't know anything. And nobody under nobody explained anything to me. So I didn't know what abortion was. I didn't know anything. And when he told me, like, oh, my mom said that you should abort, I was like, no. Something just told me, like, say no. And um, I actually waited a few weeks before actually telling my mom, but the only way for me to tell my mom was to have my dad tell her. And the only reason why I reached out to my dad was because I felt like, well, he don't care about me. You know, he's not going to care that I'm pregnant. It's not going to phase him. It's not going to hurt him as much as it is my mom. So I never had that courage to tell my mom. I couldn't. I'm like, I remember what happened before when she found I lost my virginity to this man. I don't want to hurt her that way. So I called my dad and I told him, hey, I need to tell you something. But, you know, I, w I need you to tell my mom. And it's now that I look back, like, he automatically knew, like, oh, you're pregnant. So... I told my dad, like, can you just call my mom and find a way to have her go over there to the shop? And my dad's like, yeah, okay, I'll call her. So he called her and he told her, hey, you know, can you come to the shop? Because I'm going to give you money. They always had these fights even after they got divorced. Like, my mom would tell him, if you don't give me money, you're not going to see the kids. So their arguments were always about money. So I think my dad knew that if he told her, like, hey, I'm going to give you money, she was just going to go over there. And... We ended up going to a shop. My dad's already outside. My mom gets out of the car, and he tells him, like, hey, where's the money? And he's like, I don't have no money for you. I need to tell you something. And my dad told my mom, well, she's pregnant. And again, my mom turned red. Her whole face turned red. Her chest turned red. I remember her, like, with her hand on the door, and she was just, like, shaking. She was so, so mad. And, again, that look in her face, like, why, mija? Like, why? Like, she was just angry, and my dad was just calm. He was just, like, relax, you know, relax. We'll figure this out. And you know what? I got to give it to my dad at that moment because he really helped calm the situation. And I think he just didn't know how to handle everything that had happened. And at that moment, it was just like it all came together. And he, you know, he tried to calm down the situation. My mom was calm. And the first thing my dad tells me after is, you know, there's an option. You can abort. Again, that word, you know, abort. And I told my dad, like, no. In my head, I was like, I don't really understand what that means. But no, you know, I want to have this baby. And again, I felt like I was in love. I thought this man was my everything, and I didn't want to do that. My, for the most part of my pregnancy, I stayed with my mom. I actually graduated class of 09, and I was nine months pregnant, and I had a big belly. I think I was the, I was the second girl to graduate that year pregnant. To me, it was a big accomplishment because my senior year, I had AP, AP classes, I was doing really good, but I stayed with my mom until February 8th, which was my brother's birthday. I remember a few weeks before that, you know, my abuser would tell me, well, why don't you just come live with me? Your mom's always on your case about coming out with me. You're already pregnant. Like, what is she going to do now? What does she care? You know, I'm supposed to provide for you. I'm to take care of you. Um... And I would be like, yeah, you're right. You know, I would just go along with everything this man was telling me. I didn't, I didn't question him. I just, it's like if I was his puppet, and I just did exactly what he said the whole time. So that day, um, I think he wanted me to go to his house for some reason, because he lived really close to us. Well, his sister did, and he was always there. So he told me, like, just come over to the house. And I was like, no, I can't leave, because I have to go with my mom to work today. I used to help my mom um uh, 
clean houses. So that day she wanted me to go help her. And when I told him no, he's like, no, you need to just leave. Just walk out of the house. And I was like, no, I'll just tell my mom that I'm moving out. So I packed my stuff. I went to the kitchen and I told my mom and her boyfriend, like, I'm moving out. And I moved out. And at that moment, I didn't realize that I was leaving on my brother's birthday. And I didn't know how it was going to affect my whole family. And once I got older, I realized, like, you know, this was my brother. This is the person that had my back. This is a person that I protected. He protected me. I never realized how much it would affect him or how it would hurt him. And at the moment, I didn't care. You know, I was just stuck in my, in my zone. I was pregnant, and I was going to be with this man for the rest of my life. So I moved out. And at the time, he was living with his aunt. It was close by as well. He was living with his aunt, and he was renting this room. And mind you, I didn't know what a toxic relationship was. I didn't know what abuse was. Nobody, nobody ever explained to me that a man's not supposed to physically hurt you, even though it had already happened to me. Nobody told me that it was wrong. And I knew it was, but it just didn't click in my head. So I moved in with him, and we were with his aunt. The, few, the first few weeks, everything was it, was, it was fine. I was going to school, and if I didn't feel good, I just didn't go to school. But then the, hey, let me check your phone began. Uh, who are you talking to? What are you doing? Why do you talk to your mom so much? Why do you, you know, message this friend so much? And I didn't realize that he was being you know, controlling. I didn't know. I just thought, well, I have to give him explanations because he's my boyfriend. Or I have to tell him what I'm doing because out of respect, I just need to, you know, deal with whatever he's asking or I just need to answer all his questions. And he would, you know, take my phone. In the middle of the night, he would get up and check my phone. So it progressed. It was the checking of my phone. It was the why are you going to wear those sweats today? Or why are you doing this to your hair? There was a time where he even began to question why I wanted to take a shower, why I wanted to brush my teeth, why I wanted to do, do anything for myself. And I was pregnant. I was, you know, I was already big. I was showing, and he just questioned everything I did. So the very, very first time he laid hands on me was when I was nine months pregnant, and he had a job, but he would go with his brothers on th with his brother on the weekend to DJ. His brother had a DJ, so you know his brother needed help sometimes to you know do the DJ. Or when his brother would go on a break, he would need him there, so he would go. And every weekend it was the same thing. I would tell him like, "Don't go. You know I'm almost due, and I'm scared. You leave me here, and then nobody's in the house. And yeah, I have my phone, but I'm scared. Like I don't know what's gonna happen to my body when I get contractions." And he didn't care. He would leave. But that night, he was just so angry. Like, I kept telling him, like, please don't go. Like, I, I just want you to stay here with me. I'm scared. And he kept telling me, like, I can do what I want. Like, wh why do you care why I need to go bring money? And that's one thing that he would always say, like, well, I'm going to go get us money. I'm going to keep us, you know, fed. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I was just, I was just mad and sad at the same time. And... I remember him raising his hand, and he just went straight, straight for my eye. He punched me right in my eye, and I fell back on the bed, and he just kept swinging. He socked me in my ribs like maybe three times. I started crying, and I was just in so much pain. You know, I had my, my son in my stomach, and he just kept hitting me, and he was yelling. So, you know... His aunt lived with us, so she could hear the ruckus in the room. She could hear me screaming. She could hear me crying. And he had already stopped hitting me, and his aunt comes in the room. And she opens the door, and all she says is, ¿Qué está pasando aquí? What's happening here? And I'm on the bed. I'm crying. I'm looking at her. He's on top of me, and the first thing he says is, well, she doesn't let me leave. I didn't say nothing. I was scared. I was shaking. I was crying. And she hears him out and just closes the door and walks out. In my mind, 
I was like, okay, I'm alone again. This man just did this to me, and he did it because it's my fault, because I don't allow him to go somewhere or because I'm against him going to get us money. And I said to myself, I was like, if this woman is not going to stand up for me, if she's not going to stop him, why would anybody else? And the abuse continued. And my whole mindset was if he can't, if, if she wasn't able to have my back, I can't really go and bug my mom about this because I'm ashamed and because I'm going to have this kid. And I couldn't go to my dad because, you know, I just felt like he wasn't going to care anyway. So I felt alone. I didn't know what to do. I was still, you know, I was still in high school. So the next day I went to school and I had a black eye and it was my whole black eye. Like it was bad. And my, I had a peer counseling class and my teacher comes up to me and she tells me like, Hey, you know, what happened? She, she said, you know what we do in this class, right? And I'm like, yeah. And my answer to her was, I was rough playing with my sister's in law. Like, I'm nine months pregnant, and the first thing I tell her is, I was rough playing with my sister. And I was like, I didn't realize what I had told her. And she looked at me and she was like, You're nine months pregnant. Why would you do that? And I was like, No, I'm fine. I'm perfectly fine. So they ended up not questioning me. It was dropped. Um, and with time, you know, obviously I graduated high school. And when I graduated high school, I was going to be doing a few days. And in the meantime, the, the abuse was still going on. He was still hitting me, even with me being pregnant. Once I had my son, I actually had to have an emergency C-section because his umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck. And they told me that if I didn't go to the hospital, he was going to die. He wasn't breathing right. So that day we go to the hospital and my son's born. And again, I'm in this situation where I'm going to have this baby. I'm being abused mentally, physically, everything by this man. And I still felt alone. I was happy that I had my baby and I was happy like that I gave birth to something so beautiful. But I still felt like this void. I still didn't understand everything that had happened to me. After I had him, we moved to one of his sister's house. And in this house, we, that house already had like 25 people living in it. So what we did is we rented out a room the size of a twin bed. But in that little room, the door went outside. So we barely had any room. It was me on this twin bed and my baby's crib. When I was there, the abuse escalated to not just hitting but it was he wouldn't let me sleep he would wake me up and he would throw cold water in my face he would make me have sex with him in this little spot where there was other people like it was a living room and there was this little square and his nephews were sleeping in the living room and in that living room there was another connection to another little room where there was more people there and This whole time, I'm thinking, like, okay, this is wrong, but I kept allowing it. I acted like if nothing happened. His sisters and his whole family knew that he was abusing me. They all knew. They never did anything. They never intervened. And even when they did try to intervene, he would always say that it was my fault. So I got pregnant again very quickly with my second son. My first son was born 2009, and my second son was born 2010. The the abuse was still going on this whole time. I would always get socked in the head. I would get punched in the ribs. I would get kicked in the shin. He would do this thing that if we were in public, he would, you know, flicker me. And it hurt. Like, it was in my face, in my ears. Um, He would slap me so hard in my ear that my ear would just start ringing. I would always have purple ears. Um, I avoided all contact with my family. I stayed away from everybody. And even if I did try to talk to them, he would always prevent me from actually seeing them or spending any time with them. So after my second son, um, 
I, I, even me having these, my kids, I still didn't understand what birth control was. I didn't know why he never wanted to wear a condom. I didn't understand any, any of that. And even with me going to the, to the doctor, I still didn't understand. I just kind of, like I said, I was kind of like a puppet and I can't, I went along with everything by what he said, you know, and I did what he said. After my second son, I got pregnant really quick. And he tells me, like, you're pregnant again. We can't have this son. You, we can't have this baby. And he brought up the word abort. You need to abort. And I, in my mind, I knew, like, no, I can't abort. Like, if I didn't abort my first son, why would I do it now? Somehow, I don't know how, but this man persuaded me and... I just listened to everything he said, his words. I just did everything he, s he just wanted me to do, so I did it. He found the clinic to where I could have an abortion, and I just went. And that was the first time that I was sitting in a doctor's office ready to abort this baby that was in my stomach. And they gave me this pill. They said... You know, drink it. You're going to start feeling cramps. You're going to start feeling, you know, intense pain. You just need to rest, and you just n need to let it happen. And I got home, and exactly what they said happened. That was the first time I had an abortion. And then that kind of, it kind of hit me pretty hard, and it was really hard for me because I couldn't talk to anybody. But, again, I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't know what was going on with my body. I couldn't talk to anybody. And even if I wanted to, like, I felt like they were all going to judge me. They were all going to, you know, point the finger. Like, they were all going to tell me, it's your fault. It's all, it's all your fault. Like, why aren't you protecting yourself? And, you know, in our culture, you know, it's the woman has to use birth control. So I felt like if I even said anything, it was all going to come back to me. And I remember telling him, like, hey, I think we need to start using protection or, hey, I, I think I need to start getting on birth control pills. And I think I made an, I don't really remember, but I know that I ended up having a doctor's visit and I had the pills. I ended up getting the birth control pills. And I started taking them, but I was never, I was never really, like, focused. Like, I had my two kids, my two babies. They were so little and it was always the world revolved around him. I could never take care of myself. I could never take a shower when I want. I could never brush my teeth when I want. I couldn't go outside if I wanted. If I cooked a meal wrong, he would throw it on the floor and he would hit me. There was always a consequence to everything that I did wrong. So I ended up getting pregnant again, <laughs> really quickly again. And I knew that if I told him, he was going to tell me to do this again. He was going to tell me to go back to the clinic and abort. And I was so scared. And I waited, I think, a few weeks before I actually told him. And he told me the same thing. He's like, you need to go abort. And I just did it. I made the appointment, and I went in again, and I aborted for the second time. Um, that was really hard for me. The second time, I didn't know why I did it. I don't even know why I let this man control me and take over my brain that way. I never understood, like, why? Why do I keep allowing this man to do this to me? So I aborted, I aborted for the second time. And during the first two years of my two kids' lives, not only was the domestic violence towards me, but he started hitting my oldest son. My son was only one year old, and he already knew how to use the restroom by himself. He already knew how to hold a bottle by himself. He was so scared of his father, and there I am allowing all this abuse to happen. Not only to me, but to my baby, my firstborn, my 
you know, I call him my king, and I allow this abuse to happen to him. And I never stood up for him. I never did. And the the abuse, you know, it was it was bad. It was it was it was where he would spank him, so his little butt turned purple. It was so his ears would turn purple, and he was little, so he wasn't going to school. So you know, nobody really saw. And we really didn't go out, so nobody really saw what was happening to him. And even when his family would come around, they would question it, but they wouldn't do anything. So he continued to be physical with my firstborn for a long time. And I never intervened. I never did anything, and I think that's something that's going to, always be with me because I should have stepped in. I should have protected him. I should have been there for him. But I didn't know how to be that way because nobody protected me. Nobody was there for me. So with my second child, he was still abusive towards him. And, you know, it wasn't as bad as it was for my first son. But it was, you know, it was still abuse. It was still wrong. And... When my children turned two years old, they started playing soccer. And I remember <laughs> my kids playing soccer, and it's something that they were so passionate about, but if they played wrong, he would get upset, and he would, we would get home, and he would punish them, and he would hit them in the butt, and he would, like, spank them, and he would hit them with the belt. And I think I, I just, uh, I don't want to say that I just, allowed it because I don't think that's what I did that was my I was in this in this world where I was his puppet so I think I didn't know what to do like I said because I wasn't taught that but plus I was scared of this man you know he controlled my life like I didn't know how to defend I didn't know how to defend myself how was I going to defend my kids from this man so the abuse kept happening my kids grew uh, they were growing, and, you know, he still kept hitting them. He still kept hitting me. Uh, he began more of the mental abuse with me after, like, a year after my second son. It was more like the constant name-calling. Like, he would always tell me that I was useless. Every day I was being called pendeja. You're stupid. You're worthless. You're not good for nothing. You're not even a good mother. And this was... Every single day. This was something that he made sure I knew every single day the moment I woke up. And he didn't just tell me. Like, he followed it with abuse, with physical abuse. So it was a name calling. Then right after, I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to punch you in the head. And he knew not to leave me marked, so he would always punch me in the head all the time. I would always have bumps in my head. Um, You know, he would bite me. He would... There was times where he would choke me. Um, there was times where it got so bad where I would almost faint. So he had to throw me in the shower to wake me up. And I remember almost, you know, blacking out and waking up. I don't know if I, like, fainted all the way, but I remember, like, it just went black, and then I would wake up in the shower, and I was completely wet. And, you know, he would just be like, get up, go in the room. Come on, clean yourself up, go in the room. And, you know, that was a constant thing. That was every single day, every day for a very long time. So after a couple um, months, I became pregnant with my third child, and he came out, like, surprised. I didn't know I was pregnant. I was actually taking care of myself. And, you know, I don't know. It just happened. And I was kind of, in a sense, I was kind of happy that I was pregnant because I thought, okay, with this child, I'm going to protect him. I'm going to make sure nothing happens to him. Even though, you know, I didn't do it with my two kids, I'm going to do it with him. Like, I, I don't know. I, something had changed for me a little bit. And I got pregnant, we, you know, went to the doctor's visit, and there was this place 
that offered me a free ultrasound. And um, I went and I was like, you know what, let's go get this free ultrasound. We don't have to pay for it. And obviously anything that was free right away, you know, we took it because we didn't really have that much money. We struggled a lot. So I went and they told me, you're going to have a girl. I was extremely happy but worried at the same time because I thought if this man is hurting my two boys, like, what is he going to do to a little girl? And I started thinking all these crazy things like, you know, if I suffered growing up, she's going to suffer. And I, I began to worry a lot to the point where I would have anxiety attacks. I would have panic attacks. I would randomly just start crying uncontrollably and, you know, to the point where I couldn't breathe. And then, you know, the abuse still kept happening. Um, he wasn't, by the time I was pregnant with my third child, he wasn't as abusive towards my kids. It was more like mental. He would get in their head. And if you do this, this is going to happen. And, you know, once you've been physically abused and then it stops, but you still have that mental abuse, it's like you're still being physically abused because you're consistently being called names. And mind you, my kids were small, so yeah, he wasn't hitting them, but he was still he, he was still in their head. He was still manipulating them. He was still being rude and aggressive and loud with them. And my kids were babies. They were little. They didn't deserve this. So it was already time for my due date. It was around Thanksgiving. And we're at the hospital. And, you know, they're going to do my C-section because my two previous kids were C-section, so my third had to be a C-section. And they, you know, they start doing the operation, and they, you know, they put my baby up, and they say, it's a boy. And in my mind, I'm like, it's a boy? You know, I, I, I didn't understand, like, okay, it's a boy. They told me I was going to have a girl. So that... This this happened right before I blacked out. So during my C-section, the doctor that was doing my C-section actually forgot to put this other type of medicine that they put in the epidural to block pain. So the whole time that the doctor is doing the operation on me, I felt literally everything. It wasn't... I, I felt the knife. I felt... It was the worst pain I've ever had in my life. And I kept telling him, like, my abuser, I was like, something hurts. Something's not right. I don't feel good. Like, I, um, I, I feel a lot of pain. And he just kept saying, oh, you're fine. You're fine. And then I would turn around and tell the nurses, again, one of these moments where I need help and nobody's helping me. And I tell the nurse, like, hey, there, you know, something's hurting me. Something's off. Something's not right. And all I remember was them taking out my baby boy, telling me that, I'm going to have a boy, and I just blacked out. I woke up two, I think almost three hours later in my room, and I was in the worst pain of my life. Like, I, I, I couldn't stand still. I was crying. I was moving, and all I wanted to do was get to my baby, and I couldn't because I was just in this extreme pain. And I ended up, you know, pressing the button to call the nurses so they can come give me some medicine, and they did, and, you know, thankfully I was fine. Nothing major happened. It was just I felt the whole operation, and I felt them moving and, and doing all these things in my stomach. So after, you know, I went home, um, the abuse continued. And during this whole time with my children being born, my mom did her best to get a hold of me. She did her best to contact me. She did her best to try and be a part of my life, but I really couldn't because every time she wanted to come over or spend time with me, he would tell me, like, tell her we're not home. You know, tell her, you know, make up a lie. I don't care, but don't have her come over. And he didn't want her to come over, obviously, because he didn't want her to see how we were living. He didn't want her to see how bruised up I was. He didn't want to see how my kids were scared of him. But the whole time, they weren't coming around. His whole family was always in our house. All the time, like, our house was always filled with more than 10 people. And we, I always had to clean up after everybody. 
So not only did I have the stress of the pressure of him being abusive towards me, I had the pressure of him being abusive towards my children, but then I had to deal with his whole family. And this man has like 16 brothers and sisters, and I think for the most part of our relationship, they never had my back. They always just let him be who he was because he came from two parents that were abusive. You know, it's a cycle. His dad was abusive towards his mom. His older brother was abusive towards his sister. His brother and his sister's kids were abusive with their girlfriend. So it was just a cycle. Every It was just a norm for them. And when he was abusive towards me, his family just saw it as just, you know, deal with it. You know, they didn't try to do anything to stop him from being how he was with me. They were just like, just deal with it. Just deal with it. Um... I remember after my third son, you know, my mom, you know, doing her best to always call me. And if she would try to call me, he would just click the call. At this time, I wasn't really close to neither my brother or my little sister. Um, and I had more siblings. You know, I had another brother from my mom and her boyfriend, and I had two more from my dad and his relationship. So I was really away from everybody. I didn't have no friends. I didn't talk to anybody. I kept to myself. And the abuse, you know, just kept happening and happening and happening. I was away from everybody. And I still didn't understand why I listened to everything he said and why I did all the things that he wanted me to. But obviously now I understand, like, it was just all a mental game for him. He knew how to get me since he met me. He knew my, you know, my vulnerable you know, what, what he could do to get me. He knew everything. And he's a narcissist, so he knew exactly how to get me. So after my third child, um, we ended up not wanting to have kids. We're like, no, you know, we're not going to have any more kids. And like I said, it was, the abuse was still happening, but it was more mental abuse for me. And then, I ended up getting pregnant again with my fourth child, with my fourth child, and he was born in uh, 2000. Oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. 2000. Oh my God, 14. And 2000, he was born in 2014. And when he was born, I was working. You know, I I was keeping a little bit more busy trying to stay away from my abuser, and he brought like the strength to me when he was born. He he changed my life at that moment. Like I thought, okay, yes, he's this man is still being abusive towards me, but maybe this might be my chance to, you know, talk some sense into him so he could stop hurting me and he could stop, you know, doing all these bad things to me. So when he was born, um, we already were kind of settled. We had a little bigger house. His parents were living with us at the moment, but things weren't as bad. And, you know, when you're with somebody that's abusive, you go through these honeymoon stages and, you know, it's like, okay, they love you and then they become, you know, aggressive and then it's the violence. So at this time, it was like that honeymoon stage really started to kick in where, you know, he was being extremely nice to me. He started buying me things. He was like, oh, I'm going to buy you this Apple Watch. I'm going to buy you this. I'm going to buy you that. And I think he started doing that because he knew that I was catching on to that, you know, the abuse was wrong, that it was bad, that I didn't deserve that. And he kind of saw it because I kept like, when he would try to hit me, I would, you know, step back or I would try to defend myself. You know, after my, my last baby, I kind of felt like I had to start defending myself. So that's when that whole honeymoon stage started. And he, like I said, he started buying me things and then... It was a mental abuse, and then eventually it led to him hitting me, but I never really got the courage to tell him, like, hey, you need to stop this, until like a few months after my baby was born, I would say like six months, I ended up fighting back one time that he was going to hit me, and I remember just like, he was going to swing at me, and I just pushed him, like, you better not hit me again, and we started going at it, and we started fighting, and I ended up slapping him really, really hard, and the look on his face that he gave me, like, I thought he was going to kill me. I just thought he was going to run to me, and he was just going to, that was it. He was going to kill me. 
But that moment for me was powerful because I stood up to him. It's the first time I stood up to the man that had hurt me for so many years. And it felt good. I, I honestly felt empowered. And I was like, I'm going to keep doing it. If he tries to hit me again, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this to him. And I think a few days after that is when I told him, like, hey, you know, I don't feel that you need to hit me. I don't want you to hit me. This is what this is how it makes me feel. It hurts me every time you hit me. And not only that, like, I don't want our kids to grow up like this. Just because you grew up with violence doesn't mean that we need to. It doesn't mean that we need to teach this to our kids. And his response to everything I would say was, like, that's loca. You're crazy. Like, you just need to deal with it. Like, that's been there. Like, it was always an insult after I had opened up to him. And... That kind of like pushed me to just not say anything because I just knew he wasn't going to change. And I didn't really bother, like I said, to tell anybody because I saw my mom and my dad, you know, be married for so long. Why would I do that? Like, why would I go and get a divorce? Why would I separate from this man? Like, that was going to look bad on me. And I always I always thought about what are they going to say? You know, what is this person going to say? What are they going to think about me? You know, my in-laws, how are they going to feel if I, you know, separate from their son? So I just dealt with it. I dealt with it, and I dealt with it. Um, the abuse with my kids finally stopped. He wasn't hitting them. He wasn't really being aggressive. All he was doing was being really strict with them. Like, if they had a bad game, he would get on their case, and, you know, he would punish them, but it wasn't as bad as before. So I thought, okay, maybe there's a chance. Maybe there's hope. Maybe he's going to change. If he's changing with my children, he's going to change with me. Um, we ended up moving from the house where we were with his parents, and we moved again to another house in Pomona. And when we moved there, the abuse went back to exactly how it was before. I was working uh, nighttime, and he was working in the mornings, and the only times that we did get to see each other, he was being abusive. And it was fights over the dumbest things like, oh, you didn't cook this right. And he would tell me, let's go to the room. He had this thing where he would tell me, let's go to the room. So I would just go to the room. And, you know, my kids weren't around, and he would just hit me, sock me in the head, sock me in the ribs. It was the same thing again. And in this house, my brother was living with me. It was this, um, I, I, don't, I really don't remember how, but he just told me, like, hey, can I rent a room? And, you know, this house that we moved to had four rooms. And I was like, yeah, come live with us. It's totally fine. My brother lived, my brother stayed with us, and he was, like, a few rooms down from us. And I honestly know for a fact that this man who caused, caused me harm did everything in his power to prevent my brother from seeing what he was doing to me. So if, I, if he was mad, the only thing... He would do it, be like, okay, let's go. So I already knew, like, okay, let's go to the room. And, you know, it was stressful for me because I knew that I was being abused. I knew everything that was happening to me, and I couldn't just run to my brother's room and tell him, like, hey, you need to help me. I couldn't do that. I was scared. Even though I knew I had him there, I still felt alone. I knew that I couldn't do that to my brother. I couldn't. You know, I had already put him through all this, you know, stress of me being pregnant so young and leaving him and not caring about him that I was like, no, I can't tell him that. So I never did. My brother lived with us, and, you know, this man was still hurting me. He was abusing me. He was still mentally abusing me. And I was busting my ass working. I would go to work, come home, cook, clean, take care of my kids, take him to school, I was doing everything in my power to stay strong so that neither my brother would see it or my kids. But one night, I honestly don't even remember why we fought, why he started getting mad, but I worked up this courage to fight with him, you know, argue back and forth, and he closed the door to the room, 
And he would do this thing where he wouldn't talk to me. He would give me the silent treatment. And to him, that was a form of abuse as well. And it was, you know, I, I was like, this man loves me. Like, why does anyone want to talk to me? And I would just be right there like, talk to me, talk to me. So this one night, he closed the door, and my kids were outside. My other two, ch- my two children were in the living room, and my two other kids were in the room. Something came over me. I grabbed the keys, and I grabbed my kids, and I get in my vehicle. And my mom didn't live so far from us, so... I just got my keys, and I drove to my mom's house. And my mom opens the door, and she's like, what are you doing? And I I never told her what happened, but I was like, can I just stay here? And she's like, yeah, 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 come in. So I went inside, and I was crying, and my kids were there. My kids were crying. They were asking me, like, why are we leaving Papi? Why are we leaving? Why are you being mean to Papi? And I would tell them, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I just We just need to come with Grandma for a little bit. And we had two cars, so by the time I got to my mom's house and I was, you know, trying to calm down and not cry as much so my mom wouldn't ask me all these questions, he, I hear his car. He had an eclipse, and I hear his car pull up to my mom's house, and he comes to the door. He's not wearing any shoes. It was freezing cold outside, and he was crying. The first time I seen this man cry the whole time we've been together. And... He's crying, and he's knocking on the door, and he's like, why would you leave? And he was just like this totally different man that I've never seen in my life, being vulnerable, being sad. And, you know, he's like, let me in. And my mom's like, no, don't let him in. Like, you, this isn't right. Something's going on. Just, you know, tell him to stay outside. And I kept telling him, like, no, stay outside. My mom doesn't want you in here. So eventually I caved in, and I let him in. And my mom's like, tell him to go to the backyard. So... I told him, you can come in, but you're going to go to the backyard. And he went, and he stayed there. And the whole time, he's by the window, by the door, I mean, and he's on the floor, and he's just crying. He's just crying, like, let me in, let me in. And he was playing this, you know, victim card, like if he was a victim, like I had done something wrong. And, again, I didn't tell my mom why I left, but I think in the back of her mind she kind of knew what was going on. She just... She, did ju- she just didn't know how to handle the situation. And he was crying, and my kids were seeing him, and I didn't realize the damage that this was going to do to my kids. I didn't realize how I was hurting them. But my kids were like, why is my puppy crying? Why are you doing this to my puppy? Like, what did he do to you? And, again, my kids were little. They were, you know, to me, they were, my, they were babies. So I knew that they didn't understand either what was happening. Eventually... He got inside, and he walked towards the door, and he's like, okay, fine. If you don't want to be with me, that's fine, but let me take my kids. Worst mistake of my life. But he ended up leaving, and he took my four children. And I remember my mom telling me, why would you do that? She was so upset. That same look that she had those two other times was the same look she gave me that night. She said, why would you let him take your kids? Like, I knew that she didn't hear the words coming out of my mouth saying, like, oh, he hit me. But I knew she knew the type of man he was. And she kept saying, like, why would you do that? And I was like, I didn't have an answer. I was just like, it's okay. They're going to be okay. You know, I don't have the space here with you, so let him take my kids and let him, you know, watch out for them. He'll take them to school. He wasn't working at the time because he had a surgery. So he was home. So I was like, okay, that's going to be the best option. In my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to be living in a couch. Like, what kind of stability am I going to be giving my children? And then it's four boys. Like, how am I going to do this on my own? My mom's working. You know, how am I, br- how am I going to bring this burden on them once again? Like, why would I do that? So he takes my kids, and I stay with my mom the whole, the whole time. I ended up staying with, mom, with my mom only a month. And it was getting close to July 4th. So he took my kids. I'm working. I'm seeing my kids in between my jobs because I was working two jobs at the moment, morning and night. So in between them, I would go to his house or our house, and, you know, I would just spend some time with my kids. If I could, I would cook them something, and he would let me. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't like, opposed to it. He would just be like, yeah, you could spend time with them. So I was seeing my kids, and then July 4th, he texts me and he tells me, if you don't get back with me, you're never, ever going to see the kids again. 
if you don't come back to this house, that's it. You're you're done with your children. You're never going to see them again. And at that moment, I remember it was late, and I got the text, and I was like, you know, maybe I should. You know, I, I haven't, in my mind, I was like, well, he hasn't hit me in a month. I haven't been around him. You know, maybe this is his wake-up call. This Maybe I told him before that I didn't want to be abused, but this is going to be his wake-up call. He's going to understand that I'm done and I'm not going to take him beating on me anymore. So July 5th, uh, in the morning, he sent me pictures of him and my kids at the beach, and he had bought them, you know, swim shorts, and he bought them, like, buckets to play in the sand, and I felt like crap. I was like, I missed out on that because I was being selfish in my eyes. I was being selfish. I was like, oh, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to just leave him, you know, and I thought I was being selfish. I was like, it's my fault. So something clicked in my mind, and I just went back. July 5th, I ended up going back with him, and our lease was going to be up in that place that we were living at, and we weren't going to renew it. So, you know, again, my brother was still living in that house, but when we moved, he moved. And we ended up moving to another house in Pomona. Once we moved, this was the last time we moved before we split, um, there wasn't any abuse for a while. He kind of stopped, but I was never really home because I was always working. And even when I was home, it was like I would take the kids home. I would take the kids to school. I was always doing something. So once we moved to this place, we were stable. I felt like, okay, we're stable. You know, there's no abuse going on. You know, it's going to be good. We're going to have a good life. His parents ended up moving with us because this, this was another house with four bedrooms. So his parents moved in with us. His sister moved in with us, and his other brother moved in with us. And we had the smallest room in this house. But I, w I didn't care, you know. I, I, to me, that was, okay, this is the life I live. This is, I have to have other people live in this house in order to provide for my children. So, you know, I thought things were going to be better, but obviously we had all these people living with us, and it was just becoming so stressful. I always had to pick up after everybody. You know, we always had people over our house on the weekends. And, you know, he always wanted to throw parties and have all these people over. And he always wanted to drink. And it was always me having to pick up everything after everybody. And I think at that moment, I was not, I wasn't being the best mom possible. I lost sight of what was important. I knew that what he had done to me all these years was wrong, but, you know, I became this workaholic. All I wanted to do was work. But while I was working, the abuse, it wasn't physical abuse. It began to be, again, like how we had started, you know, nine years back. He kept checking my phone. He kept asking me, like, oh, who are you talking to at work? What time are you going to get, get out? I would have to call him in my breaks and my lunch. Uh, there was times where I would have to FaceTime him. Um, he would need my location. He just wanted to know everything about every minute of my day. And even when I wasn't working and I was home, I had to be on the phone with him 24-7. I had to tell him exactly what I was doing, what I was doing, what I was cleaning, you know. And like I said, he wasn't hurting me physically, but I knew that if I pissed him off on the phone, like if I told him, I don't want to talk right now, let me clean, let me do stuff. I got to pick up after the mess with the kids and I have to go pick him up. I knew that if I said anything, he was going to be pissed. And when he got home, I already knew, I already knew the look he was going to give me. And I already knew that he was either going to hit me or he wasn't going to let me go to sleep. So in this house, I was working at night from 3 to 1.30 in the morning. And I picked up a second job as well. So I was working from 9 in the morning to 1 in the afternoon and then 3 to 1.30. And I think it was about a year and a half that I did that. That was the worst year and a half of my life. Even though, yes, the abuse had happened before, but that was just like the most traumatic and it was just the worst. Like I, I never got any sleep because when I would get out of work, at 1.30 in the morning, I still had to get home. I still had to please this man. I still had to do things with him. And if he wanted to talk, I had to sit there at 2 in the morning 
and just listen to him and just talk to him. And if I didn't, he would get upset. And, you know, his anger started, you know, getting worse and worse. And again, he started hitting me. And if I didn't want to listen to him or if, even if I was trying to fall asleep, he would punch me in the head. He would go and get water and just throw it in my face. And it was just me in the room with him. My kids were sleeping in the living room because all the other rooms were taken. So he would go get water and just throw it in my face. And if I really begged him, like, please just let me go to sleep, let me go to sleep, he would eventually let me go to sleep, but then he would wake me up again a few hours later. Again, punching me. He would always punch me in my ribs, and he wouldn't let me go to sleep, and it was just an everyday thing. So not only was I sleep deprived, I was tired, but I had to be this, be like, the best mom. I had to put up this front with my children, like, I live the best life with your dad. And, you know, every time when my kids were around, he was always hugging me. He was kissing me, telling me that he loved me. And he was always making me look like if I was a bad person. He would always, you know, tell my kids, like, oh, I love your mom so much and hug me and just show me so much affection. But behind those doors in the room, it was a different story. And it just kept happening. And that whole year and a half, me working two jobs, it just got worse and worse. Like, sometimes me and him would, you know, he would tell me, like, hey, this Friday night I'm going to tell my mom to watch the kids so that me and you and my sisters can go out. Okay. And it would be like we would go out and we would come back, and in the drive from where we were at home, something would click, and he would just start getting mad. And I would be driving because he hated driving, and I would always be the one driving, and he would just punch me driving. Like, I would just be driving. He would just punch me in the head. And I would try to fight back, you know, like I, I, I would try, but I'm over here driving, but I couldn't be a reckless driver. And it was just beyond stressful. So I started developing again these extreme panic attacks. And they were often, they were like every weekend. And I didn't know how to control them. I would cry and cry and cry and cry. And it would be to the point where I thought I was going to die. And panic attacks, a lot of people don't take them seriously, but they're all, they all, they arise from trauma. People develop anxiety and panic attacks from trauma from their life or from holding in a lot of emotions. And I started developing these, and it was worse and worse every week. And obviously it was because of everything that I was going through. And when I needed him, like in those moments when I would get these panic attacks, he was like right there. It was like he knew that he had to be there for me in the times that I needed in order for me not to leave him. It was all a mind game. Like it, he knew what to do to make me still love him. He knew how to play me. He knew how to treat me like a little puppet and for me to just do whatever he wanted. So this was around 2018. And, you know, there was talks about us getting married we weren't married we were just together all this whole time and there was talks about it. like he would say like oh do you want to you know get married and I wouldn't really say anything and I didn't want to say the wrong thing because obviously I didn't want to get hit so I would just laugh and you know but yeah mm -hmm. I wouldn't say nothing and then his family started asking like are you guys going to get married you know you guys should get married and this and that and eventually 2019 in April, we got married. I didn't know why I was getting married. I didn't know why I had said yes. I didn't even, at this moment, at that time, I didn't feel like I loved him. I was just with him because I knew my kids loved their dad, and I knew that I had to stick around, and I had to take his shit. And, you know, I felt weak. I didn't know what to do, so we ended up getting married. We got married, and, you know, my family was invited, my brother, my sister, my mom, um, all the family was there. And I had to act like if it was just the best relationship ever, I had to, you know, walk around this, this place that we were at, like if I was happily married. And I think the only thing that kept me going was my boys, like, you know, that day my boys were in their little tuxedos. They looked super handsome. They were happy. They, they kept saying, like, my mommy and my papi are going to get married. And that 
happiness in their eyes pushed me like, okay, you know what? Yes, he is abusive. He is a bad man, but he's going to change. He's, he's, it's going to be all right. You know, my kids love him. You know, my kids respect him. My kids think that he's the world. He's their God. So why would I do that to them? And I started like embracing like that moment. I was like, okay, you know what? We're going to get married and things are going to get better. And, you know, I had to put on this fake smile. I had to take pictures with everybody, act like if my life was perfect. And by this time, my dad was still not around. Um, my my ex-husband, he didn't like him. So my dad couldn't be around because he didn't like him. And even if I tried to talk to my dad, he always, like, told me, like, why do you talk to him? He hurt you so bad. Like, I'm here for you now. Like, you don't need to talk to him. So I just had my mom, my sister, and my brother there at the wedding. Um, you know, it, it was it was very, it was hard having to put that face up. Like, okay, everything's fine. Everything's going to be okay. Um, we ended up going on a little small getaway to Vegas with his family. And like I said, I thought things were going to be good. I felt confident. I felt like things were going to be fine. They didn't. They ended up being the same and November 2019 on the 4th I finally got upset one day I was just so done I was so tired I you know financially I thought I was okay because I could take care of myself and I went to the room we had gotten into an argument that day and it got really bad and I remember I actually pushed him to the bed and I got really physical with him and I was just angry and I didn't understand why I was so angry at him I knew about the I knew he was hitting me but I didn't understand why I just wanted to hit him so bad and just I just wanted to leave so I don't know how I got the courage I went to the room I remember I grabbed a few stuff I grabbed no money I grabbed a few of my kids papers and like important paperwork and I went outside and he already knew that this was going to happen, I think. He was outside, and he took my two older boys. And he, was, he had them right in front of him. And I told him, like, hey, that's it. I'm done. I'm leaving. And again, I was going to leave by myself. So I bend down, and I tell my two kids in their face, like, hey, boys, do you guys want to come with me, or do you want to stay with your dad? And this is me being tough. I was trying to be this tough mother, like show no emotion and show them that I got this, that I'm strong and that ain't nobody going to put me down. And I tell my kids, like, do you guys want to come with me or you want to stay with your dad? And I remember their faces. They were, they were so sad. They were like, what? I will stay with my dad. Like their first reaction was I want to be with my dad. And I didn't, I didn't think about the consequences about my actions that day, but I just wanted out. I just wanted to know what it was like to not be controlled. I just wanted to know what it felt like to not be somebody's puppet. So I grabbed my stuff, I grabbed my truck, and I took off. If I would have known how to do things different, if, I, if somebody had told me at that moment, like, don't do it this way, you know, go to the cops, do this, my life wouldn't have been the way it it turned out four years, like for those four years after. If I thought I had been through pain before, and if I thought I had been through hell before, the hell that I went through after was on another level. I ended up leaving. I stayed with my mom, and I was seeing my kids. I would go and pick them up on Wednesdays, kind of like what my dad used to do with us, but I would pick them up Wednesdays and Fridays, and if they wanted to come with me on the weekends, I would get them and pick them up, and we would go places. Um, and it was like that. It was civil for about a month. But during this whole time, I had already met somebody. I ended up liking somebody else, and I was seeing this person. And, you know, my ex-husband, he knew about it. So one night... And I'll never forget this night, January 12th, um, I had picked up my two younger children because my two oldest never wanted to come with me. They would tell me they would hate me, and, you know, it was tough for them. So I never really pressured them to do anything that they didn't want to. Picked up my two younger kids, and I took them to Universal City Walk. 
and we walked around. It was a good night. You know, I bought my son a, a Dodger hat because he really wanted a hat, and we just had a really good time. So I texted him, and I texted their dad, and I was like, hey, we're going to be late because there's traffic, and, you know, the kids just had a really good time. So I'm going to, it's going to take me a bit. I ended up dropping them off probably to like 11. It was pretty late. And he told me like, hey, don't let this happen again. You know, it's pretty late. I didn't think much of it. So when I dropped my kids off, my two other children went inside, were inside the house. But even if I would try to make contact with them, it was always like, no, we don't want to talk to you. You left us. So, you know, we don't want to talk to you. And this whole time, I wasn't processing everything that was happening. I just, you know, I wanted my freedom. So I started leaving, and I'm driving, and I'm driving pretty far, and I get this message from my ex telling me, hey, you're not going to talk to our son. And I was like, for what? He's like, he locked himself in the room, and he's crying. You need to come back. And it was one of those moments where he knew how to say what he wanted to say, he knew what words to use to get me to come back. So I'm like, you know what, just give me a few minutes. I got to do something, and I'll drive back. When I drove back to their house, it was already past midnight. And I get there, and he tells me, oh, he's inside. I was like, okay, well, let me go talk to him. He's like, no, 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 just just sit out here with me. You'll go in right now. You'll go talk to him. Give him a minute to calm down. It was already past midnight. Like, it, it didn't click in my head that I was at the wrong place it didn't click so he told me don't worry you know just stay out here w w me and you let's talk you know I got to talk to you about a few things and I thought it was something civil I was like okay he's going to talk to me about something and you know it's going to be a good conversation we weren't really fighting so I thought okay whatever it's fine and he starts telling me like hey I'm hearing these things that you're seeing somebody and I'm hearing these things that you know you moved on pretty quick so I tell him, I'm, I'm, like, completely honest. For once, I wasn't scared. Like, I was just telling him, like, yeah, this is happening. And I gave him explanations. And before I knew it, it was already super late. So I go inside, and I tell him, hey, I need to talk to my son. Let me go inside your house, and let me go talk to my son. So I go inside, and I try to talk to him. And he was behind the, the door, and he was like, no, I don't want to talk. And it was really late. Like I said, it was, I would say, probably 2, 3 in the morning. And, again, it didn't click in my head, like, it's late. You know, I shouldn't even be here to begin with. So I ended up trying to talk to my son, and, it, you know, it didn't happen. I come out, and I go to the living room, and my other son is right there. And it was super late again. You know, I didn't, I didn't understand, I didn't, I wasn't present in the moment. My mind was somewhere else, and it was super late. My kids were still awake, and my second son tells me, like, why are you leaving? Just stay you know, why do you guys fight? And he started asking me all these questions that I didn't know how to answer him. And I tried to get up, and I was like, you know what? It's time for me to leave. Like, it's really, really late. I don't even know what I'm doing here. I need to leave already. So I get up, and on the table next, next to where I was at, there was a paper. And in this paper, it said, I, VNA, give up my rights as a mother, and I give up all custody to blah, 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 blah. And he tells me, like, you're not leaving until you sign this paper. And I tell him, no, like, what are you doing? I'm not going to sign nothing. I wouldn't ever dare do that. Like, these are my kids. And, again, it was this, like, I knew he was mad. I knew my ex was mad, and I can feel, feel his, like, anger, and I could see it. And, you know, I began to get scared, so I tried to leave. I tried to leave through the front door. He wouldn't let me. I tried to leave through the back door. And, again, I lived in the south, so I knew exactly how to get out. I tried to leave through the side door. He wouldn't let me. I actually tried opening the door, and he got in between the door, and he's like, no, you're not leaving anywhere. So me, to avoid contact with him, I just moved on to the next door. And, again, my kids were present at this moment. So I finally got to the front door, and I told him, you're holding me against my will. I take out my phone and I start recording him. And I tell him, you're holding me against my will. Like, I need to leave. And he's like, really? Like, you're going to do that? And, you know, I have the recording and, and he, he said it. And, you know, I have it all on my phone on record. And he finally tells me, okay, go. So he opens the door and he lets me walk out. And I had my truck, so I went outside and I tried to get in my vehicle. And he follows me behind. And I'm opening the door to get in the, in the truck. And he's right here next to me, 
And he tells me, you know, don't leave. Don't leave like that. His words were like, don't leave like that. You know, you're, you're, you're not right. You're not emotionally stable. Don't leave. So I'm trying to turn on my truck, but I thought if I turn on my truck, he's going to think that I'm going to take off and that I'm going to hit him. So I get my phone and I take it out and he just snatches my phone from my hand and he walks towards his house. So I'm walking behind him, kind of like walking fast. And my two children are in the doorsteps and my other two children are awake in the living room looking out the window. He throws himself to the floor and somehow I managed to grab my phone. I ran across the street but by the time I ran, ac I ran across the street, he was already on the phone calling the cops. He called the cops and he told them that I pulled his hair and that I pushed him to the ground. And I'm on across the street and I'm calling the cops and I'm telling them, like, this is what's going on. Please get here fast. So the way a domestic violence call works now with all these new laws is the first person who calls, you know, and if they say like oh I'm being hurt and they get there and everything lines up the abuser has to get locked up so I get there and the cops get there and I think okay they're here for me finally I'm going to be able to tell this person this cop this somebody this person that has this authority my story that I'm going to be able to tell him everything he did to me and that I need to get my children out of there so the cop asked me all these questions in the meantime there's another cop inside and this cop is talking to him and to my children and I think in the time that the cops got there, I think it would have been like maybe 10, a little bit less, 10 minutes. So the whole time that before the cops get here, get there, um, he's inside the house talking to my kids. And I just knew he was telling them, like, you better say that she hit me or else I'm going to go to jail and you're not going to have a puppy anymore. The cops get there. They're talking to me. They're asking me questions. And they're asking my kids questions and him questions. And I'm thinking they're going to help me. And I finish the conversation with the cops. And another cop shows up. And she tells me, are you VNA? Yes. Do you know, are you aware of what's happening? Yes. Okay, turn around. You're being arrested. 